one family that mingles here. Conservative or liberal here, we've all got to give a little here. Big or small here, there's room for us all here. Doubt or believe here, we all can receive here. Gay or straight here, there's no hate here. Woman or man here, everyone can here. Whatever your race here, for all of us grace here. In imitation of the ridiculous love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us. Let us live and love without labels. Amen? Thanks, Grant. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Titt. I'm one of the co-pastors here at Highlands, and we look forward to this uh, first service of the new year. We have a tradition here that uh, looks back at a, at a um, practice that the Israelites developed after they had, were on their last stretch of being delivered from Egypt. Uh, they had to cross the Jordan, but the Jordan was at flood time. And so, I don't know how the mechanics of this work, but God said to send the priests with um, the Ark of the Covenant, the big box that had uh, the Ten Commandments into the water, and then the water stopped so that the Israelites could cross over into the Promised Land on dry land. And so, you know, once you get going, you're going, okay, let's go, the Promised Land's ours, let's take it. And God said, no, you need to set up a camp here and send a representative, one from each of the 12 tri tribes of Israel, who are somewhat represented here, um, and send them back into the dry river, pick up a rock, and bring it forward, and where you're camping, build a memorial. Pile up the stones and make a memorial to God. And I love the reason. Um, it, it, it said, so that when your children pass this way and see a big pile of rocks, they'll say, so what's with the big pile of rocks? And then the adults who were around during that dramatic delivery would say, oh, well, I got a story for you. So we were crossing and, and they tell the story. Um, we come from, our faith is based in storytelling. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes it seems to get reduced to um, axioms and propositions. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Or instead of stories like, so once these people were, were escaping their enemy, we're people of the story. And we like to keep stories alive. And so at this first of the year, what we do is we ask different people to share part of the story of 2000. 15, so that we can, you know, connect even with our own, because everyone in here has a whole pile of stories, and you probably haven't told many people, if any people, maybe you haven't even put the pieces together for yourself, but our stories are, are integral to who we are and how we experience life, and um, so one of the values in telling the story is that it's, we all go through seasons of life, and um, we all have really good years and some that are better than others. Some of you are going, I'd like to see one of those. Uh, so would somebody tell us what a good year looks like? You know, that's, that's all right. It keeps hope alive. Um, but it also is so helpful to, to, in our shared humanity to know that sometimes it, life is, is tough. And uh, so here's the news flash uh, for all of you. First of all, um, God is invisible. I know that rattles your faith, but God is invisible. So one of the reasons we tell the stories is because just though, even though God's invisible, God is very active and present, but he moves through people. So when Jesus, you know, says, you are my body, when God moves through people, um, God is active among us. So the stories are worth telling because God um, has been active and for those of you who are experience, uh, experiencing like a drought, or you'll, you'll hear some of that too. So our stories need to be told. And um, after they tell their story, they're going to put a stone over here on our you know, pile, our memorial pile. And um, we'll just have a, a good way of remembering that for each of us, these aren't the only six stories. You all have stories, and they're worth telling. So I first, I'm not going to be able to give a lengthy introduction, which I would love to, but I won't. So I'm going to invite Tammy Kelly, who we all call TK, yes. up here. Yes. And I will um, gratuitously hold your stone. Hold my stone. That sounds bad, but I'm going to I am from the uh, lesser known, woo, tribe of lesbian. <laughs> we were the builders. So 
If you wonder who took care of everything, tribe of lesbian. Uh, so, I didn't say that last time. Um, I'm up here to just tell you a little bit about my story, and it actually started uh, summer of 2011. I would have told you I was the luckiest person alive, and I think I probably did tell some of my friends and family that. Uh, because I had a full scholarship to the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. <laughs> Got some alums here. Uh, and I had my wife by my side who I love more than anything. And so that was basically, I started school in August and uh, before Thanksgiving my wife told me that she was in love with someone else. She loved them more than me and she was leaving me. So that's not a great thing to learn right before reading week and finals or any time, but it basically devastated me and uh, I didn't want to go on. And so the next three years, I continued going to law school. I did graduate and finally passed the bar the second time, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. it is, I don't recommend it. <laughs> I do not recommend it. If you think you want to go to law school, just think again. <laughs> uh, so, I'm going to try not to put my hands in my pockets anymore. Um, during those three years of school, it has been by far, it was by far the, the most traumatic years of my life. I went through a divorce, I lost my full scholarship, and I was left very much feeling like a failure, and that I wasn't enough for anyone or anything, and I had failed at the two biggest things that I had attempted in my life. And, um, and I wanted to stop existing. So, and last year, in this last year, I just kind of, you know, time does heal. Um, it doesn't take it away, but it does heal. And, but I started looking around and my life was just a remnant of what it had been. And two things came to my mind was my love for the Bible, especially the Old Testament. It's just so full of life and wonder and, God gives us so much there um, to live by, and he shows us all of the mistakes that people make that we continue to make today, and it's, it's kind of funny if you read it with that, that mindset. And, and there's even a talking donkey in the, the Old Testament, so. <laughs> um, but that, that led me to uh, go to the Christian bookstore. They let me in. <laughs> because I am part of the tribe of lesbian. <laughs> and uh, I, I picked up a book that just said, Rebuild. And I was like, uh, I'm big on names, so that one, that one stuck out to me. And it's a study on the book of Nehemiah, and it's a story of God's faithfulness to the children of Israel in the holy city of Jerusalem. And I was finally found my book last night, and uh, it's a great study. If you'd like to know about it, just holler at me afterwards. But just in the introduction, I was reading through it and saw some places, some notes that I'd made, and it says, Nehemiah is a great book for any of us who are struggling to walk ahead in faith according to God's word. And I have written out beside that me. I was struggling very much to have, to have any faith in anything, myself, God, and I was very angry and I let him know that quite often. Um, and then also down below that, I have got God's covenant love to his people shows itself, not just in their survival, but also in his continuing provision of godly leaders who make clear the path of faith. And I met often with Jenny during that time, and she heard me say, I'm not enough. And she saw my tears, and she told me I was enough, and she told me that I was enough for God. And it wasn't easy to hear, but I'm glad somebody... And there were a lot of somebodies actually saying it. But, uh, so the, the, the story of Nehemiah, I kind of got lost there, I apologize, um, tells of the physical state of the city of Jerusalem. They had been through many wars and exiles and the city was falling apart and the, the children of Israel, God's chosen people, were scattered throughout the land. So not only was his city broken and and so vulnerable, but his people were as well. And Nehemiah has a vision. Uh, first, he's broken by the state of the city. And he's also broken, I think, by the, the state of the people of Israel. 
And he comes in and he rallies the people, he rallies the tribes, and they rebuild the wall in 56 days. And through this study, I, I was just reminded of not only God's faithfulness to his people, I'm one of his people as well, so I was reminded of his faithfulness to me, and he, he began rebuilding me. And, and he, rebuilt, he rebuilt the children of Israel. He gave them a home again. He brought them back together, and he reinstituted the laws and, and the laws that are there for us. Actually, I know that that's hard to believe sometimes, but they are there for us, and they're, to, they're there to help us and to love us. But through friends who were patient and encouraging, through this church, through God's word, he began changing my heart and gave me a desire to live again and to feel like I was enough. And that came to a culmination this weekend as I am uh, packing up everything in my house and actually going through remnants of what my life was before. Because my, my wife, when she left, packed up about three boxes of our life together and moved to France. So I get to deal with everything else. And I'm finally doing that over this weekend because on Wednesday, a truck is going to come and load up all of my stuff. And on Thursday, they're going to deliver it to Holyoke, Colorado, which is 12 minutes from Nebraska. It's not one of its selling points. <laughs> but I am, one of the things I didn't say in the service before was that how excited I am and how I know that God has led me down this path. And he is, I could, I could talk a lot longer than I am now. But uh, he has made it very clear that this is where I'm to go. And... But as Nehemiah grieved for the city of Jerusalem and what it once was, I do still at times grieve very much for my life before. And also as Nehemiah came to have a vision for what Jerusalem could be and for what the restoration of the children of God could be, um, I now have a vision of that as I get to start a new job. A week from tomorrow, I'm gonna be a country lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> So, and that's just an example. I hope that anyone here who doesn't feel like they're enough, um, rebuilding takes a long time and it's, it's not fun and it's painful and I'm still gonna, I'll probably be like the children of Israel in the desert in Holyoke <laughs> and be like, what did you bring me out here for? Um, but God is always faithful. It just takes a while to rebuild. So I hope you will remember that. Thanks, Thank Cam. you. <laughs> yeah, how about that? <laughs> Thanks, Tammy. And next, I'd like to. Um, oh, I, that's because I can't be mic'd here and there. This is Aaron Bailey. Mix. And I will hold. Yes. Good morning. I'm Aaron Bailey. My 2015 started out in handcuffs. In May of 2014, <laughs> I sold my company to a larger company and entered into an agreement to be, to be employed by them. The money would be paid out over two years. Golden handcuffs, they call it. Around Christmas of 2014, my new boss of just six months reluctantly called to break the bad news. The company that bought mine had run out of money. I was still owed a majority of the money promised to me in the acquisition. The buyer was simply walking away from our contract. My hard work over the last 10 years would be down the drain. I felt violated. Worse, my employees would lose their jobs. Needless to say, it was a difficult time. The uncertainty, the thought of having to tell my employees, all friends, that they'd lose their jobs too. The thought of having to pay thousands of dollars in legal costs to get what was contractually owed me. The thought of starting all over, rebuilding another company from the ground up. The difficulty knowing what I had built over the last decade would be shut down in an instant. But throughout it all, God was there. God was there in my friends, in the support of my family, in the patience of my boyfriend Chad, who let me vent countless times. God was there in the understanding of my employees. God was there in my attorney, who had been with me since I started the company and who knew exactly how to handle the situation. God was there in my Deepen group, in my Highland Church family. And most poignantly, 
God was there in Jenny and Mark, who had just started a sermon series about money. Not a coincidence. On January 18th, in the thick of this battle, Mark preached a sermon titled, The Big Difference Between Self-Worth and Net Worth. The lesson was from Hebrews 13. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I wish I could tell you that I was Christ-like during all of this, that I turned the other cheek, gave them the shirt after they took my coat, I wish I could say that I felt love towards those who had done me wrong. Ha. While I was worrying about my net worth, God was showing me to look up and focus on what truly matters. After months of stress, after much back and forth, the buyer and I settled out of court, and I was given my company back. My employees kept their jobs, and I was able to resume doing what I love, running a business. God was there. In 2016, who knows if the sermons preached from this spot will so perfectly speak to me. Oh, they will. <laughs> yeah. But I do know that God will meet me here, and I know he'll do the same thing for you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron, and we welcome Becky Germont. Thank you. Hi, hey, 2015 sucked. And I did not soften that word for church because I have no better, kinder word for it. But the way that you all loved us through it did not suck. This year started with our then one-year-old son, Charlie, in the hospital for four days with RSV, and I still don't remember what it stands for. We called it really stupid virus. I did soften that S word for you. But you brought us meals, you visited us in the hospital, you brought me good coffee and a delicious bacon sandwich. Thank you, Adrian. Not long after that, a neighbor friend of ours sat us down and told us at our table that he had cancer. And as he was telling us, I reached down and felt a lump in my abdomen. So of course I'm thinking, I have cancer too, uh, you know. And then the other part of my brain says, let's not be hypochondriacs, just because your friend says he has cancer doesn't mean you just found cancer too. Well, the lump remained a mystery for some time and through the loss of my grandmother, who I had only just found at age 17 after a long, long search for my biological family. Just after she passed, we finally found out that my abdomen was growing a super rare desmoid tumor as a result of my pregnancy with Charlie. There are no specialists in Colorado, and so little information on the subject that the medical community has not yet come to a conclusion on whether or not they should call it cancer. I had to fly to Ohio to find a good surgeon to perform my surgery, and had to recover from the physical wounds as I grappled with the emotional blow of not having any more children. Finding out they hadn't removed all of the tumor was another blow because these tumors have a high chance of regrowth. But you fed us every night for weeks. You watched my kids. You lifted them and held them when I couldn't. And those of you in my Spanish class insisted that I take off more time than I thought I needed. <laughs> and you signed up to take shifts picking my daughter up from school. There are only 900 cases of desmoid tumors a year in the world. We are one in a million, and yet after the first service, someone from this church came to me and said, I had one too. And for oh. the first time in my life, I was able to talk with a real human being that has been through oh. this same rare case of weird tumors. So, wow. thanks again. Yeah. <laughs> um, I herniated a few discs, and 2000 official, 2015 officially became a literal pain in my neck. And I was told that a suspicious lump could be the beginning of my piece of the family breast cancer beast. At this point, I had up to four appointments a week, and you watched my kids while I went for MRIs, chiropractor, physical therapists, oncologists, and surgeons. 
biopsies and mammograms and blood tests, emergency rooms and EKGs and second and third opinions on every one of the above, not to mention your unwavering emotional support as it seemed like I spent six months out of this year waiting for some form of test results. As the year closed, we received conflicting news on my husband's health that is still unresolved. And all of this was layered on top of my 10-year battle with fibromyalgia in which I have not had a moment without pain in over a decade. And I'll have at least four or five MRIs this year to monitor the possibility of my tumor regrowth. And last week, they told me I have a heart condition and need a heart procedure. I want to say that this new year is going to be a fresh start for us and that 2016 is going to be awesome, but I don't always feel like it. I've struggled with maintaining the positive attitude I seem to be born with, but sometimes it has felt very forced. Sometimes I don't believe the own hopeful words coming out of my own mouth, and on more than one occasion I have felt spiritually impoverished. Even so, we are here, we are fine, I wrote, we are strong, and then I had to take it out because I don't feel strong. But if I'm looking on the bright side, I can say that my son is now totally healthy. My other daughter is free from any health problems. I had a wonderful 12 years with my grandmother, and I don't have the really bad kind of cancer. My breast lump was benign, and it's not like I need open heart surgery, and I have the most supportive husband you could imagine. I took a break from writing this to go to Wendy's on Colfax with the family. Don't judge. <laughs> I don't feel like cooking much lately. <laughs> and met several people suffering from mental and physical disabilities. And my husband reminded me that even with what we have suffered through this year, we are still some of the most fortunate and possibly some of the more physically healthy people in that restaurant. But again, you have let me step down from my commitments, take back some promises, and say, no, I can't preach this year. No, I can't do godly play anymore. No, I can't help make meals for another family. And you've also helped me not to feel so guilty for all of the no's. You have fed our bodies and our souls when we have been too weary. And this year we needed a whole lot more from you than we had to give. And I'm so grateful for the way that you took that weight from us and redistributed amongst yourselves. When it feels like God hasn't been there, I have to remember that you were his hands and his heart. So yes, 2015 sucked for the Germans, but you did not, and we thank you for that. So here is Paul Williams. Oh, oh you want me to? Yeah, Jen Jepson. And they're doing a, a tag team, kind of like wrestling tag off. Okay. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meantime, the world goes on. Meantime, the sun and the clear pebbles of rain are moving across the landscapes, over the mountains, through the fields, the deep rivers, and the deep trees. Meantime, high in the clean blue air, the wild geese are headed home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. It calls to you like the wild geese, harsh, exciting, over and over, announcing your place, your place, your place in the family of things. So I probably knew thousands and thousands of evangelical leaders. I mean, for goodness sake, I preached in three of the ten largest churches in the United States. But then I decided to become Paula, and pretty much everybody was gone overnight. And for a very, very long time, I questioned whether I ever again would find my place in the family of things. My name is Jen Jepson. My husband, Eric, and I, plus our three children, Brooks, Claire, and Andrew, have been attending Highlands Church for eight months. We live in Longmont in Boulder County. I was raised a pastor's kid in a small evangelical denomination. Church is in my blood. It is my family business. I love the church. I believe in the church. 
I see the beauty of the church as God's expression of goodness, love, and healing. Somewhere along the way, I realized many churches stopped meeting people where they were, in their suffering and pain, their questions and confusion. The good news of the gospel muted by the shoulds and musts, the dotting of I's and crossing of T's. In the fall of 2014, Eric and I left the church, choosing to remove ourselves for a time. No longer would we pledge loyalty to an organization that could not actively support entire populations. The lack of inclusion of LGBT peoples, the failure to discuss white privilege and racism, the inability for women to lead, amongst other things, fueled our choice to remove ourselves from a regular church body. The disparity between the all-encompassing love of God and the church's lack of expression of this supposed love required us to step back, to reevaluate how we felt called to living out our life of faith. We could not reconcile our growing hearts of compassion and empathy with the silence and fear. Unable to find a congregation nearby, the idea to start our own church began to simmer, something, anything. We needed a place where all were welcome. Fear checked at the door, condemnation non-existent. A place where faith exploration and questions were safe. Worship and love unconditional. Many conversations with friends and family revealed we had company. Others longing for and needing the same thing. One week after finally admitting this desire out loud, I learned of Paul's transition to Paula. Paul was a regular preacher at our church, yet we had not seen him for some time. I knew I needed to reach out, Eric saying the words, you know you have to do this, right? My stomach in my throat, I wrote her an email, to which she responded immediately. I could only imagine her pain, for I knew none of this was ideal. I questioned her if she had found a church, for this was the one I would attend also. Paula, Eric, and I met for coffee. She shared the pain of her experiences, her rejection from Christians and the church, her defenses up, her heart broken, Ours broken also, her faith in tiny pieces. We discussed with her the idea of starting our own congregation in Boulder County. She said, and I quote, do not start a church, it will suck your soul. <laughs> <laughs> I heeded her advice and put the starting a church idea high on a shelf. She and I formed a good and true friendship, a friendship of mutual support and encouragement. She aiding me in my calling, my presence assisting her with hers. How to live this life as Paula. The dream of church, the idea that church could be free from fear and judgment. A place where people practiced the art of loving well. Where things were worked out in grace while simultaneously recognizing the inherent messiness of humanity. My dream of church was not pie in the sky thinking. My notion was not foolish. I wanted to choose church and Paula did too. Paula learned of Highlands through a local pastor friend. One Sunday in spring, my family came for the first time. The beauty of this place settled deep within, my insides calm in church for the first time, as long as I can remember. We attended when we could. I texted Paula, you need to come, you will love it. I cannot even believe this place. And so in June, I came. Sat in the back in the middle with Jen and Eric, Brooks, Claire, Andrew. It was a guest speaker that day. Rachel led the worship, and I cried from one end of the service to the other. Actually, that's not exactly true. I didn't cry, I sobbed loudly, <laughs> making very ugly noises, <laughs> disturbing people for rows in either direction. <laughs> My tears trickling to the front of the building. <laughs> Came time for communion and I just couldn't quite make myself come forward. And Jen's very intuitive. She said, so do you want me to bring it back to you? I said, mm -hmm. So I watched her come back up the aisle. You know, it's true, we don't see God, but we do get to see Jesus. And I saw Jesus coming back with the communion lovingly cupped in her hands. And I thought, you know, I have found my place in the family of things. You do not have to be good. 
You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. What I love is Highlands Church. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you so much. And now, Art Story and Patrick Yeager. Do you want me to? Are you going to? Hold my rock? Yeah, I'd love to. I don't. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, it's great to see all of those faces out there this morning in the church so full. It does my soul well. Um, just over <clears throat> 20 years ago, Patrick and I stood in front of our family and friends and we committed our lives to one another. There we were in a little auxil auxiliary hall of a neighborhood congregational church, our relationship being blessed by a member of the clergy. This was long before civil unions or uh, certainly gay marriage was on anybody's radar. I'd like to think that we were uh, trailblazers back then, but so were our brave, and very brave family and friends that were in attendance that day. We'd continue that trailblazing streak when our, our son was born five years later. I know he's out there someplace. Um, that's a whole other dramatic story that we'll be glad to share with you when you have a big chunk of time. Uh, flash forward to last week, or two weeks ago actually, when Patrick and I celebrated our 20th anniversary with another gathering. Yeah. With another gathering of uh, the most important people in our lives. After getting officially married the year before, this was our opportunity to celebrate the legality of, all, legality of it all, renew our vows, and honor the relationship that we built and the family that we had become. So there we were again, this time decked out in tuxes at the Art Hotel. The evening was spectacular for a number of reasons but none more meaningful than the fact that it was literally the largest gathering of our extended family that had ever taken place. Patrick and I were truly honored to see the breadth of our family's acceptance and love, knowing that too many of our LGBT friends still struggle with strained family relationships. Another reason why December 19th was the most memorable night of our lives was because we were able to share what our Christian faith means to us as a couple. Over the years, Patrick and I have uh, had our share of struggles with the church, facing everything from judgment to condemnation to outright expulsion. This was our chance to attest that ultimately, not, not only love wins, but God wins. Having Mark Tidd and Susan Camp officiate the festivities that night gave our family and friends a clear sense of why this place, Highlands Church, has become our sanctuary and our, our spiritual home. Okay, two things, full disclosure. One, I have to segue this, um, so just know that. And two, I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, so we started our ceremony um, a couple weeks ago with the Highlands ethos. Looking out at the faces, it's kind of like looking out today, it's very overwhelming. We saw people from every part of our life, literally from the day I was born. High school friends, college friends, church friends, um, our son's school friends, just, it was a very, very powerful thing and it, Bart and I both started to tear up quite a bit, I would say, yeah. um, looking at the amazing journey we'd have. Having Brant read the ethos today um, doesn't help my tearing abilities. Um, Bart mentioned that Highlands has become our spiritual home. We've been on a faith journey for a very long time with some amazing parishes in Laguna Beach and in Los Angeles, but not until we came to Highlands did we truly understand how big and dynamic living a Christ-centered life could be. It's interesting, someone said earlier, you can't see God, but you can see Jesus. There you are. Um, 
So when the leadership asked me if I would be willing to produce this year's sustaining partner video, truthfully, I was a little nervous. Anyone, uh, those of you that know me know that I've been a television producer for many, many years, and you know I've produced a lot of things looking forward to the reward of an award or ratings, but it's a big difference to try to produce something for your church without looking uh, self-aggrandizing or you know trying to make something that's too lofty. Um, how do you talk about Highlands and the power of what we're creating? So they asked me to come interview people at the leadership retreat. It was an incredible honor to be with a group of people who are walking humbly with God through their dedication to Highlands of today and Highlands of the future. The day was even more poignant because as I was driving up to the retreat in Colorado Springs, ironically, um, the <laughs> Supreme Court decision came out legalizing. Yeah. <laughs> legalizing us. You know, like Bart said, 20 years ago, we did it because we wanted to do it for God. But here we were able to actually do it. Um, so it was that day that we decided that we were going to do the ceremony that we ended up doing a couple weeks ago. So I got to spend time with many of those attending the retreat and interviewing them about their faith journeys and what Highlands means to them. So, as I said, the segue is coming. The segue is that they've asked that me to show the video today again. Um, it will come as no surprise to know that we chose the ethos as the uh, foundation of that video. I look out at this room today and the power of Christ is overwhelming. Ironically, until three weeks ago, I couldn't cry, and now I just cannot turn it off. <laughs> um, uh, Bart and I and Brant want to thank you for being part of our spiritual journey, for being here for this church, this place that means so much to us, and I know it does to you, too. Happy New Year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'll, I'll take that. And I'm going to ask... It, that you put that stone not only for all those personal reasons, but that uh, that drive down to Colorado Springs and what happened 2015. Um, let's give thanks to God that anybody can get married. <laughs> Bam! Perfect. Married, divorced, or, Married single divorced or single here. It's one family that mingles here. It fills me with joy. <laughs> From the onset, we wanted Highlands Church to be an inclusive place. I walked in and out of many churches that felt like someone would be excluded, and that never felt right to me. There's nothing worth more. <laughs> Sorry. Walking into Highlands was a different experience, a very different experience. Conservative or liberal here? We've all got to give a little here. And that is an amazing thing, to be part of something that is that big and inclusive and really is about being a, a difference maker and a love spreader and, you know, being bigger than ourselves. We immediately felt grace and love we were welcome and embraced, and um, we needed that. I see it. I see the return. I see it through the people. Big or small here, there's room for us all here. I love Highlands Church. I think it's an incredible community, and it's a young community. I want it to be strong, and I want it to last, and I want other people to get to experience what I've experienced at Highlands. It's super important to always have the resources there so that we can continue to, to be there and to grow. Doubt or believe here. We all can receive here. Bring your doubts, bring your beliefs. Someone will be there to listen and there'll be space for you to be. I needed to receive God, and because people were able to support Highlands and give to Highlands, I was able to find God, and in, in return that saved my life. 
gay or straight here? There is no hate here. The invitation is so clear. I found a community that I could identify with, that accepted me, that loved me, and that I could also love and accept. Woman or man here? Everyone can here. This work at Highlands is important to us, and so that is something we, we believe in. We can't be a part of all the things that Highlands is doing, uh, but to be able to give is to be connected to it even from a bit of a distance. Showing up every Sunday, I get so much that I wanted to give back with my financial resources. Whatever your race here. For all of us, Grace here. We're trying to develop a foundation of sustaining partners, people who just want to say, I I'm committed here, because I think what we're doing is important in the world. We don't expect or require money from anyone and I think that's why it's so great like the people who are committed can give money so that there's so much room for people to attend that don't have anything to give. They can just receive. An imitation of the ridiculous love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us and all of us and all of us and all of us and for all of us and all of us and all of us. Becoming a sustaining partner is very much an investment in what God is going to do next. It's not just sustaining what we have for right in this moment. It's creating something that's sustainable for a future. Who knows what? Who knows what God's going to do? Let us live. Let us live. Let us live in love. Without labels. Without labels. Let, Let us, us live in love. love. Without, 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 without labels. labels. Yeah, cool. Could we uh, uh, just uh, give thanks to God together? God, 2015 has come and gone. For some, it's been a whirlwind. For some, it seemed like it wouldn't ever end. Um, but it is a new year, and you are with us um, in, in ways that you were in the last year. Sometimes visible, tangible, expressible, and sometimes silent and seemingly withdrawn. But you give us the stories to tell so that we remind each other that we can, even if we can't always touch you, we can touch someone because uh, sometimes, God, in your invisible nature, you come into the human flesh and, and we need somebody with skin on them to remind us that we're enough, that we are the beloved. And so, God, we pray that as people of the story, we'd keep telling our stories. We would respect that every person that is in this room and in this world, when we're near them, there's something going on. And you could be a beautiful part of that. So we pray, God, that we would be the ongoing incarnation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It feels a little bit of a risk when we do this, surf, um, this service and we invite people to come up and talk. Um, you know, we never want it to feel like we're um, just having a whole service for um, self-congratulations because so many people say, I love Highlands Church, I love Highlands Church. Um, when, when, when Mark and Jenny and I um, ask people to come and share, we're we're not expecting people to say that, um, and we're certainly not wanting to um, spend an hour patting ourselves on the back. Um, I think what, what we hear is the reality of what happens at this table. Um, you know, when Paula says, um, I saw Jesus in Jen that day, um, and Patrick stands here and says, you're, you're Jesus, this is, this is where this comes from. Um, because it, it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He was in the upper room with his disciples and they were celebrating the Passover meal and he took some of the bread. He broke it and he gave thanks for it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And I don't think he meant just like, oh, remember Jesus? That was great. I think it was this like, you take this in and you become this living remembrance of Christ for the world. Later, he took some of the wine and he said, this wine is the blood, my blood shed for the forgiveness of all people. Take this and drink and remember me. We get to participate in this big story and then it trickles into all of these little stories. This body of hands and feet of loving people, bringing food, taking care of kids, whatever it is. It's, it starts here and it moves on. And that's... 
I think a big part of why we even get together every week, and it is why we do this ritual every week. Um, communion servers, will you please come and <clears throat> get the stations ready? If you are hungry for God today, you are welcome to come and participate in communion. Whether this is your church or not, whether you've ever participated before or not, you are welcome. God welcomes you. Um, what you'll do is um, come down and they will offer you a piece of bread or a gluten-free cracker. You will um, take that and dip it into the juice. And we have um, just grape juice at all of the stations. Um, you are welcome to do that. There are other ways to participate if you'd like. We have candles that you can light as a symbol of your prayer or your thoughts for somebody. We have a questions journal and we have a gratitude journal because we think God equally welcomes all of us. And I think we all carry our questions and our, um, our gratitude. It's really fun um, also if you don't have anything to write to just go back and look and see what people have written um, over the last few years. On either side of the room, we have people from our worship prayer team who would love to offer a word of prayer for you. If you have something specific, you can tell them. Or if you'd like, you can just walk up and cross your arms over your chest and they'll just say a blessing over you, um, which is really, really beautiful um, to try if you've never done that. Um, you are also equally welcome to just remain in your seat, um, to think about all that you've heard, to observe what's happening around you, and to just be still. Um, do whatever you'd like during this time. Um, if you'd like to come down, please come as you're ready.